This is day 17 of our 40 day adventure in the Arctic and only the third time I had to get the solar panels out to charge my external power bank. My main camera froze a couple of times but refused to stop working no matter how hard I abused it. To the south and back! I recorded 1575 hours of audio in those 40 days and crashed my drone into a mountain one kilometer away which ripped off one propeller but I was still able to fly it back to me. Now let's see how I did all that. One foot in front of the other, and then you do that for several days, and suddenly you have crossed the whole Svalbard. Hey there, I'm Moritz, and in case you're new here, I talk about my experiences of professional documentary movie production in remote places all over the world and want to teach you the skills and techniques to do the same. Now, talking about my latest documentary movie, End to End Svalbard here, there have been many people asking on how I filmed all this while skiing through Svalbard for 40 days, how I charged all my equipment on the go, how I backed up my files and so on. So basically there's five topics that I want to cover today. First, the electrical department of this production, including my self-built power bank, the solar panels and how I managed having full batteries throughout the whole trip. Second is all about my camera, what camera I used, how I used it, my settings and how I unfroze it sometimes when it got a little too cold. Third, which I personally find the most important topic of all, is my sound setup. I've said before that I mic'd up everyone and recorded every day, all day, but let's dive deeper into that as well. Then I'll talk a bit about my drones, I had three drones with me. And lastly a topic that I find often to be overlooked and not really explained in any behind the scenes and that's backing up all my files and I didn't have a computer with me. Alright, let's get going. This is my power bank and it took about three months to put it together. Now, I can't really tell you how to build one yourself, but I'll show you how I did it so that if you really need and want to, you have the kind of basic understanding to start researching on how you could build one yourself. So my initial problem was that I needed enough power for all my gear, including all power banks from the other guys on this trip. And I already had this power bank from Gold Zero here. Now, I did some research if this system would work and while they are awesome and I've seen them being used on kind of similar films, this setup wasn't really kind of working for me because the big problem for me was that they are capable of way more than what I needed and they're also way heavier. So what I needed was a system that I could take on a plane, is sturdy and does not stop working in the cold, that is repairable and has a capacity of around 1 kilowatt hours, which is, if you compare it to standard power banks, around 270,000 milliamp hours. Here I had a little advantage and that was my wow. background in flying FPV drones wow. because besides knowing how to actually fly those drones, you kind of have to learn the basics about electronics and circuits, um, learn soldering and to fix those drones yourself and especially learn all about voltages, milliamp hours, kilowatts and so on. I could take this knowledge to plan my ultimate self-built powerhouse and after a lot of research I decided to build nine of these 3S uh, batteries, each with 10,000 milliamp hours, that I then connected with self-made adapters to one big 3S battery with 90,000 milliamp hours, or about one kilowatt hour. And now that's very technical, all of this, especially if you don't know anything about how voltages differ in batteries or what milliamp hours versus watt hours are, but if you do know what I'm talking about, then you got my numbers here. And this weird 9 battery setup connected to one big battery was also only necessary to get them on a plane since you can take those huge power banks with you but it is allowed to bring batteries up to 160 watt hours or sometimes 100 watt hours. Basically my battery compares very well to this one from Gold Zero. It's about the same capacity with almost 1000 watt hours but what made me not to choose this Gold Zero power bank is the weight. This one weighs almost 15 kilograms, while my self-made batteries plus my two giant solar panels weigh 15 kilograms together. All right, let's do a quick rundown here for those interested in how I wired my battery to my solar panels. And if you're not interested in the super technical section, you can skip to this timestamp from chapter two, which is all about my camera. 
So I took a pellet case that I had at home, isolated it with some foil that is usually to protect car batteries against the cold and I don't really know if it helped, but at least it was worth a try. Then I glued two of those red things inside, which are 12 volt motorcycle seat heaters. Um, I just repurposed them to warm my batteries because lucky for me, I had a good friend who made me aware of the fact that although you can discharge batteries while they are super cold, you cannot charge them while they're cold or you'll destroy them almost instantly. So I had to make sure whenever I want to charge my power bank to heat the batteries up to around four to five degrees Celsius and then feed the power into those batteries. Now I taped the batteries itself with Velcro into the box, wired them to my solar charge controller, which has three cables. One goes to the solar panels, one goes to my power bank, and the third one is the output where I charged all my electronics from. And to charge all my electronics, I had this FPV drone battery charger with all kinds of adapters to USB, where I then plugged in my camera batteries, my power banks, the drone batteries, and all the other electronic stuff. So as you can see, most of the setup I had is kind of uh, inspired of my knowledge from the FPV world, which helped me a lot here. This little box here is a thermostat and while it's not really a necessity, it allowed me to see the temperature of the batteries and it also switched off the heaters when the batteries kind of reached 15 degrees Celsius to save some energy. The solar panels were from a company called Overland Solar from the United States and after a lot of research I decided to go with these since they are rated at 130 watts, which is a lot. They're super rugged and they don't weigh too much for the power they can produce. So I got two of them and they held up really nicely. So no regrets with these ones. And if anything would have failed on this setup, I also had a smaller 40 watt uh, panel with USB port. So in the worst case, I would still have the opportunity to charge my camera batteries off this one. As always, there are a few things that I would change in the future. So every time I charged the box, I had to open the lid to feed the cable outside. So I would probably install some ports somewhere on the outside of the case to never have to open it. And I would probably install a switch to turn the heaters on and off, which makes it way easier to control. And also install some foolproof plugs where you can't accidentally short circuit the whole system. And now comes the part where I have to be honest to myself because I believe that 99% of people watching don't want or just can't build their own batteries. So I think as a good alternative, a bunch of 99 watt hour V-mount batteries will work just as well. Perhaps you can also chain them up a little bit like I did to make one big power bank out of those. Or just go with the heavier gold zero power bank or any other brand basically. But you might need to think about how you get uh, this power bank to your destination because you will not be able to take those on a plane. And one last thing here before we finally come to my camera setup. If you decide to do anything with batteries yourself, which is more than just plug and play, please, please, please do your research because working on batteries is super dangerous. They can explode if you accidentally short circuit them. And if you chain up a full and an empty battery, for example, God knows what happens, but chances are that they either get really hot or explode right away. So be super careful. My camera setup, finally. So I filmed everything on old Nikon vintage prime lenses because I just love the look of those. And they're not ultra sharp like those model lenses, but they are lightweight and have long focus throws, which makes manual focusing super easy. The only thing I kind of dislike is that every focal length has different flare characteristics. So some are green, some blue, some orange, but for the size and the price, it's totally acceptable. And I had a 24, a 35, a 50 and an 85. And most of the time I would either have the 35 or the 50 on my camera. Now I had an old vintage Nikon zoom lens as well, which is horrible to be honest, and I hate using it. But at some rare occasions I would use the 200 millimeter length, like for the reindeer shots, for example, and those long shots over the sea ice. And I'd say it's super handy to have a long lens in your kit as well. Now I slightly modified them with this adapter so that they all have a 77 mm filter thread and then used a mist filter and a variable ND filter on them all the time basically. I also believe that I had two modern lenses with me as a backup. This one, the 17 to 28 mm from Tamron and then a 28 to 75 which is filming right now. But I never took them out of the box and I always used the Nikon vintage lenses. 
Oh, and a fun fact, the 85 and the 50 broke towards the end of the trip. The 50 millimeter could suddenly not focus to infinity anymore and the 85 millimeter could not focus at all. I guess those screws holding the focus ring just got loose somehow. Um, so I didn't know how to repair them during the trip, but as soon as I came home, I googled and found some YouTube videos explaining how to take them apart and repair them. So uh, that's also a great benefit for those vintage lenses that you can actually repair them in the field if you know how it works. Now I filmed the whole movie with my Sony Alpha 7S III and since this camera is filming me right now as well, we just pretend that this camera was my Sony because it's almost the same size and form factor. Now I had a strap like this one uh, that was always around my neck and that was basically it. The camera was always handy and the Sony really takes a lot of abuse. So I had it out in the extreme cold, in snowstorms, during rain even, and it just refused to stop working. Although it froze here and there and I needed to unfreeze it over the stove, but that worked just fine. I also talked about that in my other video about the mental challenges of a trip like this. So if you haven't seen it yet, it is up here or down in the video description. Now my camera settings for those interested, it's kind of different for each camera, but if you want to know what I set my camera to, there you go. As a tripod, I was looking for a super cheap, lightweight and sturdy video tripod with a fluid head that you can level, which is already hard to find under a thousand euros, but finally I went with one from Benro, which is for around 350 euros super affordable and did the job just well. Although the head is technically no fluid head, but a friction head and when it gets super cold outside, the gel inside or whatever they used freezes and it gets very hard to turn. That's not a huge deal breaker, but something to be aware of. So if I had the choice, I would probably get the Sackler Flowtech and a real fluid head next time, which is probably the best overall tripod setup for documentary work. But it's also about 5,000 euros, so more than 10 times what my Benro cost, which back then was not really an option for me. Some people asked about the gimbal and although I had my old Ronin SC with me, I wouldn't bring one on the next trip, I guess, because I used this on only two shots in the entire film and it didn't really add so much value that I'd say it's worth it. And it only takes up space and weight. So for me at least, next time, no gimbal. I said it before, for me the most important part of documentary filmmaking is the sound and you should always prioritize good quality audio over the perfect picture. Now I don't say that I had the perfect sound technique on this film and there is definitely a lot to learn from me as well. But here's what I did. We were seven people, me included, so I got seven of these Tentacle Track E audio recorders and if you've never heard of them, they are basically standalone audio recorders with lav mics and they record internally so that I have sound even if my camera is turned off or if the characters are so far away while I'm filming landscape shots that they are out of reach for standard audio transmitters. So every morning I would give each member of the team their own microphone attach it to their collar usually, turn them on and hit record and that all within the Tentacle iPhone app, which makes it super easy to access all microphones while the people are wearing them. And since the company Tentacle usually stands for timecode synchronization, I had this little box, which feeds the timecode into my camera, synchronizes all the audio and video. And when I get home to post-production with all this audio and video, it's a few clicks and I have all my video from this camera synced to all the audio from the recorders. And that's a game changer for editing. On top of those seven tentacle recorders, I had a small video mic Go from Rode attached to my camera too, which was also helpful in some situations. Oh, and to charge those microphones, I again built my own cable for this, which is basically a power splitter with eight outputs. So all my audio devices go on here and I only use one part in my power bank to charge them from, which was definitely essential to get them all charged in time every night. All right, next up is my drones, which was one small DJI Mini 3 Pro and two FPV drones. Now I brought those two FPV drones because I wanted to do these high speed flights and really bring another perspective into the film. But in the end I kind of flew only about three or four times, which is not a lot. But in my opinion those shots really add to the look of the film in the end. 
Then the rest of the time I used the DJI drone and I chose this model because it was cheap, about a thousand euros back then. It's small, very lightweight and still has a very decent quality and what I didn't expect is that the newer DJI models are so good in self-recovery that once during the trip I took some chances and flew backwards for quite some while to get a nice landscape shot but ultimately didn't see the mountain behind me. And I don't know how, but I somehow crashed into this mountain, the drone recognized this and put all its power into recovering on its own. It got back in the air and I was able to fly it one kilometer back towards where I was standing. And as you can see here, the behavior of the drone got kind of weird and it was extremely difficult to fly this thing in a straight line. So when I finally landed, I saw that one of the propellers was completely ripped off from the impact and it flew back with only three propellers left. So very impressive. And always have spare parts ready, it was a quick fix afterwards and the drone was back in the air in no time. Now I talked in my other video about how I kept the drone batteries warm because DJI is very restrictive and won't let you fly with cold batteries at all. And I talked about flying this drone in extreme cold weather and snowstorms, so check that out if you haven't already. Last time I set up was my file management and since I absolutely didn't want to bring my laptop I chose this, the Lazy Backup on Set Solution or BOSS. So basically that's a hard drive and a small computer in one device and it has ports like USB-C and a card reader to offload files from your camera, GoPros, drones and audio recorders straight to this thing. Now, after I had all my files from the day on this 2TB drive, I would then plug my first 5TB drive onto it and create sort of a backup of the day onto my main drive. And after that was done, I plugged my second 5TB hard drive in and created a second backup of the day. So what I have now is two identical backups on my two drives and I can delete everything that is on this intermediate drive to make space for the files of the next day. So in my case I shot 55 hours of video and 1575 hours of audio and 5TB was just right for this amount of footage. Now if you're shooting with a let's say RAD camera or multiple cameras at once you probably need way more storage and I would say you need to roughly calculate some estimated file sizes, how many hours of footage you want to shoot and so on. But in my case 5TB was just fine. Now I did two backups, maybe to save some money on the third hard drive, but if you can, do make three backups of your files, because when one of two drives fails, you're suddenly left with only one copy of your files and you never ever only want to have one copy of your files, especially if it's a paid job or a big project like ours. So my drives luckily didn't fail, but next time I'll probably consider taking three backup drives. Oh yeah, and since all three drives are traditional rotating hard drives, I put them in another pillowcase to protect them, which kept them quite safe. But if you can, don't put all your backups in the same case. Better have two or three separate cases, each with its own backup drive, and you're way safer. And if you want to go extra safe, you could also consider getting this intermediate drive as an SSD, which I believe exists uh, from Lacey and some other brands as well. But it's way more expensive and at that time I just didn't have thousands of euros to spend on an SSD when I already had this at home, so I just went with this one. There you go, my technical gear breakdown of a one and a half months movie project in the Arctic without access to power or a computer and Although I had some minor issues here and there which I was able to solve on the spot, it all went super good and it's really hard to predict kind of what could go wrong on a project like this, but if you're prepared and have a good amount of tools, some spare parts, some spare cables maybe, and in the best case some knowledge in the back of your head on how to fix things, then you'll probably get through it without major issues. And before I say goodbye here, there's one last tip that would have saved me a couple of times and that's to bring sensor cleaners because I forgot them and when on day four a drop of water went straight from the tent ceiling onto my sensor, I had to improvise and believe me there's nothing scarier than to take a rocket blower, cover it with a cloth and then tap around your camera sensor without knowing if you actually get it dry or instantly destroy your camera. So get sensor cleaners and you will have a good time. Now I hope all this was useful information for your next project. So. Get out there and shoot the best film you can. See you next time.